Right. So I'll leave her to it. Martine Knoop. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. I will talk today about the research that we're doing at the Technical University of Berlin, and it's, uh, the talk is called a Characterization of uh, Potential of Daylight to Fulfill Non-Visual Requirements. And the reason why I want to talk about this is that I'm, I think I need to exclude the audience, but if I look around and talk to lighting engineers, um, architects, and um, manufacturers, we talk about non-visual effects of light, they talk about ar artificial lighting, whereas I believe that the daylight is a way better light source to fulfill these requirements. So what I will do today is uh, uh, see if we can do something in research, or at least pr present what we do in research to promote daylight to fulfill these requirements. Um, just for those that are not familiar with the non-visual requirements, uh, it's everything we beyond uh, things that we see. Uh, and we need bright light for that. So you can do that with artificial lighting, but if we look outside, you can do that pr perfectly well with uh, daylighting as well. Well, there are some other things that are important as well. So it's the spectral power distribution. So the spectrum of the light is important. And if you look at this graph, you see a gray line. That's the um, spectral sensitivity of our visual system. And the black line is the spectral sensitivity of the so-called in, uh, intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. So these cells that are more or less uh, responsible for the non-visual effects of light. It's moved a bit to the short wavelength. And if you look at daylight in comparison to artificial lighting, daylight has quite a lot of bluish component in it. So if you want it to be effective, use daylight, I would say. Well, there's another thing that's not so often used in lighting design, is that if you look at the position of these specific cells, they are more or less primarily based in the lower part of the eye and in the part near to the uh, nose, so the nasal part. So it also uh, is important where comes the light from. And if you look at this picture, the green area is good, the orange area, according to some researchers, the or orange area is somewhat less effective and the red area is not effective at all. So it says if light comes from below, it's not effective, but if it comes more or less from the front, there where we have our normal windows, sorry about the roof lights, uh, where we have the windows, uh, it's very effective. Up till now, we don't have any measure to talk about that. So we have a measure to talk about horizontal illuminances, and we will have more discussion about the daylight factor. I'm not going to bring this up uh, here. But if you look at how we judge that right now, we talk about horizontal illuminances, daylight factors on a horizontal plane, or as in Germany right now, two points in the room. It doesn't say anything about the light level of my eye. And if we talk about the spectral power distribution, the spectrum of the light, we talk about 6,500 Kelvin. This is the normal spectral power distribution that we <coughs> use for daylight. Well, I'll show you some research, uh, some measurements, that show that we have higher color temperatures. That means that we have a cooler light when we use daylight. And if it's cooler, the blue component increases. So it's, the cooler it gets, the more effective it is to, to use it for non-visual effects. So the, uh, the metrics that we have right now can't help us to say something about non-visual effects of light. So we see it as real lighting engineers. So I'm, uh, I'll talk about measurements and how to talk about uh, how to show that. Um, so what we would like to do in our department is have a new way to talk about lighting, daylighting, light level, spectrum, or, um, the um, spectral composition, and uh, direction of the light. So describe it differently than we use it right now. And I'll start with the spectral composition, because the light level is something that I think most of you uh, know. If we look at the spectral composition, we know a bit about daylighting. So we know that it's more or less 6,500 Kelvin, cool white light, when we measure it on a horizontal plane. But if you measure it per element of the sky, which is what we do with this measuring equipment that's on our roof, it has a small mirror in it, as you can see, and it turns in this direction, so it actually scans patches of the sky, and it scans the spectral 
um, composition of the light. So from this, I can say what color the light has from a certain area of that sky. And the sky is uh, divided in 145 patches. It's a normal distribution, as you can see here. So you see on the right-hand side, the upper part, the sky dome with its 145 patches, or half of it. And on below, you see the projection. So if you would look from above uh, on, that, uh, on that sky dome. In the middle, you see the zenith patch, and on the, on the outer circle, you see, the, you see the, me uh, the measurements of the horizon. And what we do is we measure for each of these patches the spectral power distribution of the light. What you get then is, is something that you can see in this picture. It's for a clear sky. We have a luminous, of the brightness uh, picture on the left-hand side, and you see the sun. And on the right-hand side, you see the color temperature of each patch. And uh, what you probably not can, uh, cannot see is the numbers in there, but it ranges from 7,000 Kel 7, Kelvin to 20,000 Kelvin. So we see 7,000 Kelvin in the outer range, that's the horizon, and we see 20,000 in the, I would say, left upper part, which is opposite of the, sky, uh, of the sun. The higher the color temperature, the higher the value, so the cooler the light. So it's not 6,500 Kelvin, it's something different it's more or less 6,000 Kelvin when we look at overcast skies. That's right. So this is an over, more or less overcast sky. You see luminous distribution, not completely uniform, but it's more uniform than we saw just before. And you see on the right-hand side the picture with the color temperatures, and it has values between 5,000 and 7,000 Kelvin. So we can say a bit more about uh, the light of the of the sky uh, when we make these uh, measurements. Just to give you a short summary on that, what that, does that mean? I picked out one measurement for one day. We make a lot of measurements, but one day, 27th of August, uh, around 11 o'clock in the morning. If I would measure on a horizontal plane, I would have about 60,000 lux and a correlated color temperature of 6,000 Kelvin. So that's what we normally work with. If I would now look into my room, I would just see one part of the sky. So I either see, when I have a south-facing facade, I see the south part or the north uh, part. And if I would do that and I would measure really on the facade, I would have, in this case, about 6,000 on one side and 7,500 Kelvin on the other side. So I already have a difference. It's getting better when we go into the building. If we go into the building, we see an even smaller part of the sky, as you can see here. And the an interesting thing, if you look at the north facade, you see quite a cool part. OK, this is a clear sky on a specific day, uh, but we see a cooler part, and it results in about 12,000 Kelvin on a, hor on a vertical plane. So I measure here 12,000 Kelvin light. I have a lower light level than on the south uh, part. 1,350 lux, and on the south side I have, I have to check, about 7,000, uh, 7, 8,000 Kelvin, but with a higher level. If I then say that light level and spectral composition both play a role, it could be that I have, I have lower light levels, I could kind of make up with this with higher color temperatures, because both is more effective. Uh, both more higher light levels is effective, but also color temperature, higher color temperature is more effective. So maybe a north facade is not so bad, also not for uh, non-visual effects. But then there's this part on directionality, and here comes the nitty-gritty um, research freaking part. So I hope, I, <laughs> I hope you can follow me in the coming uh, few minutes, and if not, I'll definitely provide you with my, um, with my uh, slides, and you can ask me all the questions you want afterwards. If I want to include the directionality, I have to know where the light comes from. And there's one researcher working in our institute that really looks at that from an indoor perspective. But I'm pretty sure that you can use that for daylight as well. So just imagine you have a direct light source, it's on the left-hand side, and a completely diffuse light source. Under the direct light source is a measuring point, as you can see in the picture, and in the middle of this completely diffuse light source, there's also a measuring point. And she looks at how much light comes into a certain defined solid angle. So it's luminous flux per solid angle for the lighting in engineers. And if you would draw that out in a graph, you would see from the directed light just a, a 
uh, a value from one side, because the light comes directly from above. As soon as, as I have a completely diffuse light source and a measuring point in the middle, I get something like this, because I get lights from all the sides. Oh, you don't see this? Lights from all the sides, and the values are everywhere the same. So I can describe with this way, where does the light come from? And if I need that for my non-visual effects, because I, know, I need to know where the, direction, where the light comes from, then I need to describe it in such a way, I think. So that's what we try to do with daylighting as well. So here's the picture of the luminance of the sky again. So you see that it's very bright around the sun. Bright is red. Blue is darker. So it's bright around the sun, and it's get, getting darker in the northern part of the sky. If I now look at a certain situation, I could say something about the brightness when I, I look at all these different directions. And that's what we did. So we turn this picture, just to make it a bit clearer for you, and then we take out just the south-north axis. So I exclude the sun for, for a while, so I'll take that out. And you see now it goes from red to green to blue and back to red in the northern part. And if I would draw a graph, as you just saw, um, I would get something like this. So red, where I have high levels, and uh, then also long arrows, and where it is blue in the picture, I have smaller, shorter elements. So this is the direction of or the, the amount of light that gets to my measuring point. Of course, I have sunlight, so I get a lot of reflection from the ground. So I get something like this in within, no, well, not in the room, but outside, if I would measure that. Well, if I want to use that in a room, I have to split this graph because I have a south-facing fa uh, facade and a north-facing facade. So I get something like this, and if I then bring it into my room, it gets something like this. And I think I need to explain that a bit. So you see the longer ones going outside of the window. So I get a lot of light from the, from the sky. That doesn't mean. You see two going down. That's the reflection of sunlight in the f on the floor. So I get a lot of light from the floor as well. And then I get some interreflection in the room. Yeah? If I now want to combine that with the spectral information that I just had, I could color code that. So that's the research point. I could color code that and see the bluer the light gets, the higher the color temperature, so the higher the effectiveness. So long arrows are good, blue is good as well. And if I now would take into consideration what's really effective, I could with um, with weighing factors, I could just kick out the information that's not important. So I could just say, these three areas are the most important ones, these are the ones that I take into consideration for my non-visual effects. That's just one, one example. This is another example for north facing. As you can see, the lines are shorter, so there's not that much light, but they're bluer, because there's a higher color temperature. If we Conclude that, that means that we have to, uh, if we want to do properly and really show the potential of daylight, we have to look at light levels, spectral composition, and direction of the light. This is um, quite a lot of work. So what we intend to do at the university is make lots of these graphs as, graphs as you can see up there. And you have to keep in mind, that's just one plane. You can imagine I need to look at all the directions. So it's actually a three-dimensional construct for every moment of the day. So I need to make this that you see on the upper part in a three-dimensional construct. And then, if I want to do it like John, I need to do that for every hour of the day, for every day of the year, to get a proper evaluation of the non-visual effects in a specific room. That's a lot of work. And that's what we're going to do. We depend on measurements that we have, and then we will conclude something like an effective illuminance in the room with a certain color temperature, so that you can work with that. I cannot do that alone, and I definitely did not that much work for this part. So I depend on a good team. I work with an indoor and daylighting team of the Technical University, and there are specifically six people that do a lot of work in, in here, and I would like to show you who, I, who that are. So it's Caroline Lietke, who is working on the light direction. It's Aisha Diakito and Nils Weber, who are also in the audience. They work on spectral sky models and the use of the spectral sky models for sensor simplification 
and urban planning. And then we have a student that does all the spectra data collection and visualization, which is Frederik Rudowski. And then we have two PhD students that look at these non-visual effects and directionality, as you can see, and spectral power distribution, which are Kai and Inga. And without them, I couldn't do this presentation, so I would like to thank them, and I would like to thank you for your attention.